we unite together in prayer. <laughs> Eternal and ever blessed Lord, we are gathered here in an attitude of outward worship. Grant, O oh Lord, that there may be a similar attitude deep in our hearts and that we will come not merely in the outward form of worship, but that our hearts will be led into the very presence of God, that our souls will be warmed by the word and fed by the truth, and that we will feel ourselves engaged in worship. For this is different to everything else we do in life. We do many things, and this is utterly unique. Help us, Lord, to appreciate that, that we will feel that we are in worship and that we will feel when we leave here that we have been in worship, that we have been in the presence of God in that special and unique way which we find in public worship. We are always in thy presence, Lord, the Lord is everywhere, but in a very special way, we come into the Lord's presence when we gather as we do now. Help us, Lord, to come with a sense of the glory and the majesty of God. And we have sung already of that. May the words we sung, may they affect our thinking even now and may they shape our worship this morning. Help us to come with true penitence, hearts that are truly sorry for sin, that have come to hate sin, and that long to be clean from it, and find the washing that we need, not in our own efforts, but in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And give us eternal one, an understanding today in our souls, of who Christ is, the eternal Son of God, of what he has done by coming into this world. He came to lay down his life, to give his life a ransom for sinners, in order that peace with God and eternal life itself could be purchased, could be ours, if we put our trust in him. All we give thanks today for our Lord Jesus Christ, for his love, for his grace, for his inexpressible kindness, for his goodness toward us, for his readiness, for his willingness to come into the world, for his readiness to die the cursed death of the cross, where the burden of his people's guilt, his people's shame, his people's sin fell on him that infinite and immeasurable burden as their damnation became his and he bore it giving satisfaction to the demands of divine justice so that he could say from calvary itself it is finished and oh how gloriously wonderfully it is finished the way is opened for he is the way the truth and the life and we can come to the father through to his son and we can find peace and hope and life. Our Lord, we pray that today, that is how we would come with our eyes fixed on Jesus, our eyes trusting in him and finding in his shed blood and in his grace, our hope and our all. We pray eternal Lord, blessing upon each one of us, our homes and our families, our differing circumstances. We give thanks eternal Lord for and all who are able to be out this day, we pray for those who are unable to be with us, some we trust temporarily detained, and we commit them in their needs to the God of all grace, and others who have known longer-term health problems, we pray for them as well. We pray, eternal Lord, for all who belong to us, our kith and kin, there will be difficulties and problems there always are in this world but we leave them in greater hands than ourselves. Whether they are around us here in the community or whether they are away in study or in work 
on land or on sea. They are known, all of them, to the eye and the hand of God. Graciously work in their lives and win them and woo them for Christ himself. We pray, eternal Lord, for blessing upon the wider work of the community and uh, the gospel in it. We give thanks for these days of evangelism that uh, have just passed over the past, past few days. And we pray God's blessing upon every piece of literature distributed, every word said. Grant, Lord, that it may produce great fruit to the glory of God and to the redemption of souls. Remember, Lord, my people in this world, remember them as they gather today in worship, they may feel weak, they may feel discouraged and disconsolate. They may feel the enemy at their heels. They may feel sin within them. They may feel their faith is small and their love is small. And they may wonder at times if they have anything at all. Sometimes they feel they do and sometimes they feel they don't. Help them, Lord, not to trust in their feelings. For feelings come and feelings go. But to trust in the living God. To trust in Christ and to trust his promises. Taking him at his word and give them more and more. We pray of a, a longing after him and a fashioned in their own hearts after his example, the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, how we give thanks for it. Remember, Lord, the wider work of the denomination. We pray for all our congregations. And we remember particularly today the congregation in Harris as a new ministry begins. Grant, Lord, that it may be blessed and owned by the great king and head of the church who provides ministers and who gives pastors eh, out of his own eh, provision. We remember the mission work of the denomination. We think of Parthipan in Sri Lanka. We pray for the God's blessing and keeping upon that work and indeed others to be raised up who would share with him the burden of ministry and diaconal work. We pray for our friends in eh, France and Spain. We Think of those across the Atlantic. We think of the work of the Middle East Reformed Fellowship and Hudson Taylor Ministry into the Far East. We pray for those who engage in that primary work of evangelism amongst the Lord's ancient people. We see the fields are white to harvest. We pray that the Lord would raise up laborers who would engage in the work of the gospel and that against every opposition, against every barrier that might be put up, that Christ and his grace and his power would win through and break in and win and woo and change as only he can do. We pray Lord's blessing upon those who govern us. We pray for the queen and uh, the royal household in its own duties and in its own responsibilities. We pray for government in London and in Edinburgh. And we pray that it would be fashioned According to God's word, we acknowledge, Lord, that it is not. Even as we confess sin, we must confess the sins of the nation. And we pray for national repentance. But it's not the sins of the nation that are most before us, but the sins of our own heart. And we confess them and plead for cleansing. The sins of against the first table of the law. Our failure to honor the Lord, his day, his word, his person. Our failure to love our neighbor as ourselves. Forgive us for our pride, for our selfishness, for the deceitfulness of our hearts, for how quickly we excuse ourselves, but oh, how heavily we judge others. Forgive us, Lord, for our critical spirit, for our coldness and often our lack of love. Give us something of the grace and the heart of the master uh, that we will be better equipped to serve and to live in this world of ours. We pray that we would shine as lights in a dark place if we have come to know Christ. And if we have not, that we would flee to him today, that without a moment's delay, we would run to the place of shelter, that we would run to the place where we would find hope, A, for the hopeless, and mercy and grace for the poor and the guilty. Receive us, Lord, as we come. Cleanse our hearts, cleanse our worship, cleanse it all, purify it, and receive it in and through our great mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we ask all. Amen.
We're going to read together now in the scriptures of the New Testament and in the gospel according to Mark. Now, if you've been with us for the past couple of weeks, you'll know that we've started a series of sermons through the gospel of Mark. It's my intention to work our way through this particular gospel on Lord's Day mornings. <clears throat> And we're going to read again, um, in fact, some of the verses that we've been considering over the last two weeks, as we read from verse 1 of Mark, chapter 1. So the gospel according to Mark in chapter 1, reading there at the beginning of the chapter. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And they went out to him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were all baptized of him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of skin about his loins and he did eat locusts and wild honey and preached saying, there cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straight away coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Heard my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan. He was with the wild beasts. And the angels ministered unto him. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea for they were fishers. And Jesus said to them, me after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straight away they forsook their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship mending their nets. And straight away he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. And they went into Capernaum, and straight away on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority, and not as the scribes. And there was in their synagogue a man with a nun, <coughs> clean spirit, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> was in their synagogue, a man with an unclean spirit. <clears throat> and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What are we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. When the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? 
What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever. And on they tell him of her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And immediately the fever left her. And she ministered unto them. And at even when the sun did set, they brought to him all that were diseased. And them that were possessed with devils and all the city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said to him, All men seek for thee. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. And he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee, and cast out devils. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him and saying to him, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and saith to him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed. And he straightly charged him and forthwith sent him away. He saith to him, see thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way. Show thyself to the priest and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. You remember the, there had been in the Old Testament law clear guidance about the cleansing of lepers and so on. And the Lord respects that because the, the Old Testament here may have been in its dying days, if we can put it like this. But he still respects and honors all these ordinances until the day would come with his own resurrection when they would finally and fully pass away. But he went out and began to publish it much, that is the man who was cleansed, and to blaze abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city. It was without in desert places, and they came to him from every quarter. Trust the Lord to follow with his own blessing that reading of his own holy and inerrant word of truth and to his praise and glory may it all redound. We're going to sing now in Psalm 119, Psalm 119. We're going to sing from verse 9. The second part begins with a question. And then he answers the question, by what means shall a young man learn his way to purify? How can I uh, be clean in heart? How can I have peace with God? All of that is taken in that question. And here's the answer. If ye, according to thy word, there to attend to be, the answer lies in God's word. And then he goes on to tell us about how he longs for and follows after God's word. Unfeignedly thee have I sought. With all my soul and heart. This isn't a, a sort of half-hearted following after the Lord. It's, it's, it's wholehearted as we say. And then he has this prayer. Oh, let me not from the right path of thy commands depart. In other words, keep me, keep me in the right way. Thy word I in my heart have hid. That I offend not thee. O Lord, thou ever blessed art. Thy statutes teach thou me. The judgments of thy mouth each one. My lips declared have. I've, I've commented often when we've sung this psalm that there's a whole host of words used in Psalm 119, and they're all describing God's word. That's what it means by judgments there in verse 13. It doesn't mean uh, a fierce judgment. It's, it's, it's the judgments of the word of God again. More joy thy testimonies, verse 14. 
way than riches all me gave again it's god's word verse 15 i will thy holy precepts again god's word make my meditation and carefully i'll have respect unto thy ways each one upon thy statutes my delight shall constantly be set and by thy grace i never will thy holy word forget he knows that he'll forget it but he says by god's grace i won't i will retain it and it will stay with me and it will be a blessing to me and for me well the whole of this second part then from verse nine by what means shall a young man learn by what means Oh, my God. 
Well, friends, seeking the light of God's word, we turn again to that passage in Mark's gospel that we read together for the sake of those who just joined us from the Sabbath school was Mark chapter one. Mark chapter one. And last Lord's Day, we looked at the section up to verse 13. So we take up our reading this morning and our consideration at verse 14. Mark 1, reading at 14. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said to them, come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straight away they forsook their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the ship, mending their nets. And straight away he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. And so on. Well, it's sad news that greets us there in verse 14, isn't it? We learn that John the Baptist has been put into prison. And for the last two weeks, as we've been opening up the Gospel of Mark, we've seen the special place and the special role that John had to play. And we might say to ourselves, well, this is, this is going to spell disaster for the Lord's work. How can the Lord's work progress without John the Baptist? He's so influential. He's so important. But John was just the forerunner. John's ministry was particularly designed to prepare and open up the way for the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And now Christ's public ministry is beginning. We saw that last Lord's Day, indeed. And as his ministry begins, John's must come to an end. And there's a clutch of lessons in that itself. It reminds us that God's timing is always perfect. John isn't removed too soon. He's not left too long. It's exactly the right moment for the torch to pass from John the Baptist to the one that John himself said was infinitely greater than himself. We, we wonder at God's timings and things happen. And maybe John's disciples, well, there's no maybe about it. They would have been very perturbed and disturbed and saddened at what happened. But they could be assured the Lord's timing is always perfect. And if we trust him in his timing, it will be well with us. But not only is God's timing perfect, but God's working is so mysterious we might have said, well, we'll leave John and John and Christ. They can work together and a two are better than one, aren't they? Well, that's not how it was going to be. God's working is so mysterious. And sometimes things happen and they seem to be, to our way of it, a weakening of the work of the gospel in this world. But not at all. The Lord has his own ways and they are higher than ours. Well, there are four things that I want to draw to your attention this morning as we come to these verses. Now, I want us to notice, first of all, and this is the first main section on your sheet, children, that the king's arrival is announced, and you'll find that in verse 14. Now, you might be saying to yourself, what king? I don't see any king in these verses. Ah, but we do. Because the Lord Jesus Christ here, whose public ministry is beginning, and Mark is beginning in his gospel account to introduce us to Christ, he is emphasizing for us right at the very beginning that the Lord Jesus Christ didn't just come as a, a private individual, that he is coming here as somebody who is the long-promised Savior. 
And all the way through the Old Testament, promise after promise had been given that the Savior would come. And when he comes, the Old Testament says, he will be a king. Now, of course, they were looking for a different sort of king, a worldly king, a king who would deal with their problem with the Romans and so on. That's not what they got. They got a spiritual king with a spiritual kingdom, but a king nevertheless, the one who is in fact king of kings and lord of lords. You notice the way Jesus comes and twice in these short verses, he speaks about a kingdom. Verse 14, Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Verse 15, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. If you have a kingdom, you've got a king. And he's saying, I myself am the king. Now, of course, many others have come down through history and they've said, well, I'm a king as well. Jesus wasn't the first or the last. But unlike all the others, as we'll see in a moment, he was able to demonstrate that he really was the king. God is publicly here proclaiming and installing his son as the king that was long promised. And as you read on in Mark's gospel, don't we begin to see that so clearly? That's why we read the whole chapter this morning. What do we see in these following verses? A king again and again. He's rebuking illness. Peter's mother-in-law is healed. He's rebuking the leprosy that plagued that poor man at the end of the chapter. He's even dealing with devils and evil spirits. He's coming as a king and he's using his authority. He's saying, I am the one long since promised. Mark is saying to us at the very beginning of his gospel, this is the king. The king has come. And this is how we must understand Christ. Don't make the mistake of just thinking of him as a, as a good teacher or a, a moral leader. He's all of that, of course. But as I said, I think it was a week or two ago, I said, let's not patronize him by pretending that's all there is to him. Not for a second. He is the king and we must reckon with him as a king. And our actions and our reactions to him and our responses to him whether we're aware of it or not at times, is the action and the reaction and the response to a king. Christ is a king. And whether our response to him in the gospel is negative or positive, it's the response to a king. You might think twice before you disobeyed a king. Most of the kings and queens we know are, are very benign and a uh, fairly uh, gentle sort of characters. But of course, in the history of this world and, and in the world still in places, there are kings and you don't obey them. You do what they're told, what they tell you or else. And if you were living in a place where you had one of these kings, you would think twice before you disobeyed him. You would say, well, he's the king. I'm, I'm not sure about what he just told me to do, but I'll do it anyway. Here is the king. We might think at times that we can come and hear about Christ and hear his call to us to come to him. We say, well, I can, I can ignore that. I can disregard it. Well, we can't because he is the king. Do you think twice when you think of Christ and do you remember he is my king? Do you have peace with the king? Do you obey and submit to him? He is no ordinary king. Christ is king. And if you take nothing else with you today, if you forget everything else I'm going to say, take that with you. He is king. He claims that authority. He claims that place in your life. What right does he have? He has every right. Every mind. 
the king's arrival is announced. I was remembering this week, they, in my former congregation in Glasgow, they had a practice that on the, before every service, the Bible was taken in. The, one of the elders would come in with a Bible. I would wait in the vestry, come in, and the Bible was put in the pulpit and opened. Then I would come in. It's not our practice here, of course, but it was a good practice. It was a way of saying, this is God's word. This is special. This is different. This is distinct. Listen well. Think carefully. This is very solemn. So the king's arrival is announced. But then secondly, we see that the king's message is described. And you'll find this in verses 14 and 15. Now Mark calls it good news. And I dealt with that two weeks ago at verse 1. And I'm not going to go over that again. But Jesus here in these verses breaks down that good news for us into two particular things. First of all, if you look at verse 15, saying, Jesus is saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, the time for Christ to come, it's arrived. Repent and believe the gospel. That's the two things that Jesus says. As king, he says, first of all, repent and then believe the gospel. Now, what is repentance? It's one of these words which we use sometimes, but how clear are we about what it means? Well, I, I took the catechism with me this morning. And here's what the catechism says. Repentance is a saving grace whereby a sinner, listen to this, out of a true sense of his sin and apprehension or understanding of the mercy of God in Christ turns with grief and hatred from his sin to God with full purpose of an endeavor after new obedience. Well, you say, I didn't catch all of that. Well, here's what it's saying. Repentance, what Jesus was calling them to, is a turning away from our sin to God. When somebody repents, they become convicted of their own sin. Maybe before they used to say, well, I'm not perfect, but I'm I'm not all that bad, and I'm certainly not as bad as all these other people. That changes. And they begin to say, well, I don't know about other people, but I know what I'm like. I know what my heart is like. I know what my heart is capable of, and it's not good. And I can't stand before God with this heart and with this sin. They become convinced of that. They begin to hate it. They want to be free from sin and from its, its power. And from the stains that it brings into their life. And it's not a temporary thing. You know, sometimes people have a sort of temporary change of heart. And they, they maybe they get a fright. And they say, well, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to change my life. That happens frequently. For all I know, maybe it's happened to yourself. Maybe you remember times when, when that happened to you. Maybe... <laughs> Maybe it's exactly where you are spiritually just now. When you say, well, I'm trying to be better. You know what happens? These things pass. You get a wee fright, but it passes, doesn't it? It's been compared by somebody to sailors in a storm, and their, their ship was full of cargo, and they thought, we've got to get rid of some of this cargo, or the ship's going to go down. So they start throwing it overboard. And the storm passed, and the sun came out, and they're scratching their heads and they're saying, ah, oh, we shouldn't have thrown all that good stuff overboard. We'd have got through the storm. Weren't we foolish? It's not something temporary like that that we're talking about here. No, this is a change. And it's not you that's doing the change. It's the Lord that's doing the change. Bringing you to an understanding of your need of salvation, a need of being saved. And leading you slowly, maybe very quickly actually, to Christ, the great and only Savior. C.S. Lewis says, repentance is something harder than merely eating humble pie. Repentance, says Lewis, means unlearning the self-will that we are, that is so deep in our hearts. 
We want to be king, don't we? Jesus comes along and he says, there's only one throne in your heart. It can only be you or me. And if it's going to be me, then you must be dethroned. There must be a change. Have you repented? Can you follow what I'm saying? Can you understand? Are you able to say, yes, I know exactly what you mean? But are you saying, I don't, I don't really understand? Well, here's Christ as a king, and he's commanding repentance. He's not suggesting it as, as something that might be quite good to think about. It's a command. Oh, well, you're saying, how can I? Well, you must come to himself, because the one who commands it is the one who gives it. What he asks of you, he'll give to you. It's not the wonder of God's grace. He doesn't come as a, as a tyrant with a huge stick and say, repent or else. And you say, well, I can't repent. And you'll say, oh, well, you must. And I'm not helping you. No. He comes into the lives and hearts of his people. He gives them repentance. And maybe that's where you need. Maybe that's where you need to start. To go to the Lord and say, I didn't follow what the minister was talking about this morning. I, I can't follow this business of repentance. But I'm told that Christ as king is commanding it. Help me. Enable me to repent. And I tell you, nobody ever knocked that door in vain. Will he have me if I come like that? Maybe it's presumption of me to come like that. Friends, he commands you to come. Jesus comes and he's saying, repent. Repent. It's not me that's saying it. It's the Lord that's saying it. He's saying, whoever you are, repent. And then what else does he say? He says, believe. Verse 15, believe the gospel. Believe the good news. Literally, it says, believe in the gospel. What is a Christian? Is he somebody who signed up to a, a certain collection of doctrines and beliefs? You know, a Christian is somebody, first of all, who has repented, who has turned from his sin. With a measure of grief and hatred for it, and a longing to be what he was not before, a longing that they would have peace with God. And they have come to trust in Christ. That's what it means to believe the gospel. It's not to believe that Christ lived in this world. You can believe that. Never be a Christian. Though a Christian is somebody who relies on Christ as his only way of salvation. Who has come with a burden of sin. And who said I can't do anything about it. I need a savior. To cleanse me within my heart. To unite me to himself. In living faith. I need Christ. And he says come unto me. All you that labor and are heavy laden. And what does the child of God do? They, they put themselves in his arms. They trust themselves to him. There was a very famous tightrope walker called Blondin once. I think I might have spoken about him before. And he would do all sorts of tightrope walking tricks, and they were amazing. And one of the most astonishing was his walk across Niagara. Niagara Falls. It was a, a rope from one side to the other. And if you've ever seen pictures or anything of Paul, it's a drop. It's, it's huge. It's immense. He went up with his long pole and he walked across. He walked back and the people applauded. They were astonished. And then he said to them, I want a volunteer. And I'll carry this volunteer across. And the people said, no, no, no. He said, do you not trust me? Do you not believe I can do it? There was one person who said, well, he said, I believe you can actually. 
think he clambered onto his shoulders. They set off and they made it across. Well, we might say, I believe Christ is a savior. But are you trusting in him? Have you come to trust in him and in his finished work as the only way in which you can have peace with God? My friend, if your religion doesn't have this at its heart, it's missing the most key component of them all. Ah, here you are, Christian, today. And he has carried you across the ravine, across the chasm. You couldn't do it. But he has bought for you peace with God. Now you are adopted into God's family. And you are an heir of heaven. Repent and believe the gospel. We need to flee, friends, to the hope that is set before us. Right repentance and faith, they go together. No faith is true faith, but faith that is tried to repentance. I came across this quote. I must move on. I came across this quote from Professor John Murray this week. It is impossible to, dis to disentangle true saving faith and repentance. And he puts it in a lovely way. Saving faith is permeated or soaked through with repentance. And repentance is soaked through with saving faith. The two go together. Now the gospel, the good news demands a response. The king has come and the king has summoned them. He has said, repent, turn from sin and come and trust in Christ. Thirdly, we see that the king's people are called. We've seen the king's arrival announced, the king's message described. Now the king's people are called, and you'll find this in verses 16 to 20. And as Jesus comes, he calls them and he tests them. He tests two things particularly. First of all, he tests their priorities. Now, children, you might struggle with the word priority. Well, a priority is what's most important. The thing that's most important. Jesus is testing them. They're there and there's Peter and James and uh, Andrew and, uh, and John and James. They're, they're, they're fishermen. And they hear Christ coming. And he says the kingdom has come. The king has come. He says repent and believe and come. Come to me. And they're busy. They're mending their nets and they're listening. How are they going to respond? Well, Jesus tests their priorities. How important was Jesus to them? What's it to be? Galilean fishermen. Is it just another day in the old life? Or is it Christ? Are you going to follow him? Are you going to hear him? Are you going to come to him? Now, James and John had a boat. Things were going well. We're told at the end of verse 20 that they employed others. Wouldn't have been easy for them. They could have said, well, you know, the time isn't exactly right. And, and there are so many problems in the way. Maybe, maybe come back another time, Jesus, and we, we, things may be easier. And often the gospel comes at times like that to us. And Jesus tests us. He says, are you for real? Are you serious? James and John, they had responsibilities for their family. They had responsibility to their father. It would have been easy to say no, or at least not now. But you know, they said nothing can stand in our way. Nothing is more important than Christ. Nothing is more important than following the king. Nothing is more important than obedience, not the mending of the nets, not the business they're engaged in. Oh, they said the Lord will take care of the business. I wonder what stands in your way between yourself and Christ. Oh, you say there's, there's things and they're not easy. Oh, I know, friends, they're not easy. And you say maybe later, later.
and you sigh. I have a question for you. Have you ever brought these things to the Lord? Have you ever come to him and said, Lord, I hear the gospel. I hear myself being called in the gospel. I know I need peace with God. I know I need pardon of my sin. I know I need these things, but there's all these obstacles and I, I can't get them out of the way. Have you ever taken them to him and said, Lord, deal with what I can't deal with? Maybe that's where you need to start. Maybe that's the answer to your spiritual problem. He tests their priorities uh, and he tests their resolve. He, he's, he's, he's going to see if they'll really follow Jesus. Other people were watching. Them. What will the other people say? James and John, they, they've gone to follow the Lord. They, they must be, there must be something wrong with them. They might have thought, well, what will our father say? Well, Christ calls us in the gospel. He comes to us still. The king comes and he says, you've got to repent. You've got to trust in me as the only way of salvation. You've got to give up everything else and come and follow me. And he calls us and he tests us. Are we wholehearted in it? Well, for Andrew and Peter and James and John, it was wholehearted. They heard Jesus coming as a king. And they followed him. Is that a mirror of your own life? Have you heard him calling you? How do you respond? Now maybe. Maybe the thought that's going through your head just now is well I did. I heard the Lord calling me and I came very close maybe to being saved years ago, and I let it pass, my chance is gone. Then that is the words of the enemy of your soul. If you're still here, on mercy's ground, as we say, the door of opportunity is open today, today, as it says in the psalm, if you hear my voice, today, today, now is the time for response. All you say, it'll be easy at another time. Friend, it'll never be easy. But it's impossible without the work of God's Spirit. You go to the one who calls and he'll enable you to obey himself. But it may be that things are holding you back that you have to let go. There was a boy once and he got his hand stuck in a vase. And you know how it is, his, his, his fist was clenched and it, it wouldn't come back over the, the rim of the vase. And they tried, they tried butter and they tried various things. No. So eventually they said, we're going to have to break the vase. And they were very sad because it was a, a vase that had been in the family for many, many years. So we'll just have to break it and get his hand out. You know what the boy said? Would it help if I let go of the thing I'm holding? Of course, as soon as he let it go, his hand came out. Would it help if I let go of the thing I'm holding? Our friends, maybe you're holding on to things. They're keeping you from Christ. What will it profit you? Will you gain the whole world? If it's at the cost of your soul. My time is gone. We've seen the king's arrival is announced. The king's message is described. Repent and believe. The king's people are called. And finally, the king's workers are sent out. He sends them out to be fishers of men. For the good news of the gospel itself. And I'm not going to go into that this morning. Come after me and I will make you fishers of men. I will transform your life. And their lives were transformed. And they never looked back. You know, if you had met these men years later and you had said to them, do you regret that day by the Sea of Galilee when you first began to follow the Lord? Oh, they would all say no. Not for a second. Or you could ask the Apostle Paul, 
cost you a lot to be a Christian, Paul. Do you have any regrets? Oh, no, he says. Not for a second. Because I know in whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed to him against that day. Are you persuaded? Christian, you can be persuaded. In the midst of it all, you can be persuaded that he will keep you. Just as he kept Peter and James and John and Anna, he brought them to himself and he kept them with himself in his goodness and in his grace. The king has come. The king has spoken. Now, we must respond. May God bless his word. Let's pray. We give thanks, O Lord, that Christ is king, that he comes with all that authority, but that he is a good king who commands us to do what we can only do with his own help and by his own power. Help us, Lord, today to recognize his kingship. Help us, Lord, today to bow the knee before his throne. Help us, Lord, today to confess that we have at times set ourselves up as rulers and that we have not given him and his word the respect and the place it should have. Help us to repent of sin, to believe in Christ more and more, to trust in his saving word, that he came into this world to save sinners, that he died as a substitute for them, and that if we trust him, he really will save us. Go before us, we pray. Watch over us throughout the day. And all we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We're going to sing now in Psalm 63. Psalm 63. Psalm 63 from the beginning. Lord thee, my God, I early seek. My soul doth thirst for thee. My flesh longs in a dry parched land, wherein no waters be. And so on. Here is, he speaks in verse 3 of God's love and grace being better than life. And uh, the joy of the Lord in heart and soul. One through five. Four stanzas, Lord be my God. I already see it. Lord.
of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion and fellowship of God, the Holy Spirit, rest on and abide with you all now and forevermore. Amen.